Hi, and uh, good evening. Uh, thank you uh, all for coming. And, uh, and I'm very excited to see so many people for our uh, very first uh, Clayman conversation uh, uh, with Moira uh, Donegan and, uh, and Yvette Dion. Uh, I am Adrian Dobb. I'm the director of the Clayman Institute. Um, for those of you who are new to our activities, uh, the Michelle R. Clayman uh, Institute for Gender Research uh, was founded in 1974 is right over there uh, and, uh, and operates as an incubator uh, for collaboration, uh, engaging diverse groups of ex experts and uh, feminist scholars. And we have uh, fellowships for graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, um, and faculty members and conduct uh, our own research under, under uh, my directorship. And we have a uh, public facing uh, aspect, which is uh, what you are all part of today. Uh, and the, uh, this is the first edition of our Clayman Conversations. It's uh, a series in which we bring feminist leaders to campus uh, who are engaged with sort of everyday, uh, with the politics of the contemporary moment and who are driving uh, conversations in their respective fields. Um, tonight and in future events, uh, we're addressing, we're hoping to address timely um, uh, topics of uh, great social import, sort of questions that we feel are important to be discussed on a university campus uh, and uh, uh, beyond. Uh, and I'm really glad to see that so many of you have turned out for our first edition of this uh, and have uh, not gone to the other event um, that is also happening uh, that will not be uttered here uh, today. Uh, I should briefly mention that we are being video recorded. This might be um, of interest uh, to, to some of you. Uh, in terms of how this evening is going to go, uh, <clears throat> we, will have, uh, we will have a conversation uh, after my initial remarks. Uh, we'll try and get into a discussion uh, fairly quickly. Uh, we will also uh, ask you to participate. Uh, to that end, we have put note cards on your seats. Uh, I will be reading them. Uh, my eyesight is like, kind of bad in, in light like this. So uh, write legibly, um, use both sides if you need to. Uh, it, I, I really do think that this is a, a topic that um, I was just saying to our, our discussants <clears throat> that all of us live with to some extent. And so I think it's gonna be really, really interesting and important uh, to get your voices uh, into, uh, into the discussion, uh, which will hopefully be sort of around 620, 630 um, or thereabouts. Uh, so, uh, before uh, I introduce uh, uh, our speakers tonight, um, I, I thought I'd just briefly uh, tell you what got me interested in, in this topic of whisper networks. Um, and I'll just tell you two anecdotes, um, uh, just because I think that, that this, this is a topic that's almost best addressed anecdotally, uh, because it, it's often a, a phenomenon that doesn't sort of come into view as a whole phenomenon, it's just, it's the way we live. Um, and so in the summer of 2017, I got an email from a German newspaper that wanted to do a, a profile of a hip American comedian that they were sort of starting to find out about in Germany. And the comedian was Louis C.K. And I wrote back and said, I, I could write something on Louis C.K. for you, but you should know that there are these rumors about Louis C.K. and that uh, I really don't think you want to publish this. Uh, and, and uh, we had this kind of awkward back and forth. Um, and, uh, and they wrote back very nicely and they said, well, we understand, but um, uh, do you think we have to mention these rumors? How well known are these rumors? How do you even know of these rumors? And as an academic, that stopped me in my tracks. And I thought, well, how do I know these rumors? Where I'm not, you know, I'm not in stand-up comedy. I'm not an entertainer. I'm not a journalist. How how had I come by this knowledge, and what was my responsibility with that knowledge once I had it? Um, and and I then proceeded to sort of um, <clears throat> to sort of gaslight myself a little bit, and I, I sort of was like, do I really know that this is true? And and uh, you know, and and uh, and, and uh, luckily I came down on the side that I was reasonably certain. Um, <clears throat> but but it, it it got me really thinking about what sort of knowledge this is. How is it? How how does it? Um, uh, travel, and how do traditional media relate to it, right? The, the first question I got back from the professionals on the other side of the Atlantic was, what type of information is this? What are we supposed to do with it, right? They, they were looking to put it in a box, and I, I didn't quite have a box for it. Um, the second anecdote uh, I just came across uh, last week, reading Ronan Farrow's uh, 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 just published uh, Catch and Kill. Uh, there's this moment 
where NBC basically does what the title says. They catch his story and they, they kill it. Um, and the terms in which they do it is precisely by assigning kind of a location to the information about Harvey Weinstein that Pharaoh had at that point amassed, which was substantial. <clears throat> and uh, Noah Oppenheim, who's still the president of NBC News, as I found out, uh, was like, this is not national news. Do it for the Hollywood Reporter, right? This is in the information may well be factually correct, but it belongs in a different place. It needs to, it's for a different, it's a different kind of information. So I think that's the, the topic, uh, th uh, that's what makes this topic, I think, really interesting for this moment, that A, <clears throat> there are these categories by which we have filed away this kind of information at the university, in media, uh, in politics, et cetera, but they're becoming, starting to be mobile. There's, there's flux going on there and there's development going on there. And so uh, I, 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 I'm really glad that I'll be joined today by, by two people who I think can help us uh, puzzle through some of these issues and think through what is changing, what isn't changing, <clears throat> how power and information interact uh, in, uh, in this particular moment, in the Me Too moment. Um, and I'll just briefly say a few things about uh, both of our, our speakers. Maura Donegan uh, is a <clears throat> writer and feminist living in New York. Uh, she's an opinion columnist uh, at The Guardian, and uh, her writing has appeared in N Plus One, uh, The Paris Review, The New York Review of, of Books, The London Review of Books, uh, Book Forum, and other places, and her first book, Gone Too Far is forthcoming from uh, Scribner. And Yvette Dion <clears throat> is uh, a, a black feminist culture writer, editor, and scholar. Uh, she is the author of the forthcoming Fat Girls Deserve Fairy Tales 2, uh, uh, which is coming out with uh, 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 Viking. Uh, presently, she's the editor-in-chief of Bitch Media and writes extensively for a number of print and digital publications, including Cosmopolitan, Time, uh, The New York Times, The Guardian, Self, and Harper's Bazaar. So please join me in welcoming Maura Donegan and Evette Dion. <clears throat> Welcome. Um, so I thought that to start the conversation off, uh, I, I would just ask you um, whether or not you, the kind of story of change that we suggested in the announcement for the event, uh, whether you think that's accurate at all. Uh, we sort of, we figured we had to tell a story and the story we thought was maybe about change, but uh, is, is Me Too a rearrangement of public and private information or are we, seeing, uh, are we seeing sort of more of the same? Uh, are, there, uh, are there things in flux, or, uh, or are we just sort of seeing how information has been marshaled by uh, those who uh, couldn't get their voices heard in other ways all along? Um, thank you, thank you for that introduction and for that question, uh, and thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm interested in how whisper networks and sort of gossip as a category and uh, rumors about sexual misconduct in particular, how they sort of like undermine the idea of what the private is, right? Because it's information that has been deemed private by sort of institutions, certainly by men in power, but which is functionally quite public. Uh, it just it does not... You know, it's very well known, it's commonly spread, it's fairly accessible, although I hope we get into accessibility a little bit later. Um, but it's not deemed legitimate and it's not given legitimacy by institutions like, you know, say NBC, who are trying very hard to avoid uh, giving it the legitimation. So it's, and that legitimacy may or may not bear any kind of uh, relation to the truth. Like it might be illegitimate because it's untrue and it might be perfectly factually true and still deemed illegitimate information. Uh, so I think the categories of public and private and legitimate and illegitimate in information were both like kind of deeply troubled by this movement um, when something like an open secret about a man's sexual misconduct is sort of dragged from illegitimate r r rumor and then sort of laundered into legitimacy by like a big New Yorker investigation uh, and like given this institutional stamp of approval, it kind of calls into question like what we were all waiting for and what that information lacked when we all had it, but the institution hadn't sort of stamped its, its approval on there. Right. Thank you. 
for your intro and thank you all for being here. I will also kind of tell a small anecdote. So I was in Hawaii last week, brilliant, beautiful, loved it. Um, and I went with three, one cousin and two close friends and we went to breakfast together. And midway through this conversation, we all started crying. And I'm, like we're in paradise having this conversation about how whisper networks function within our own families, right? And so we were talking about how these predators, literally male predators within our families, were operating and no one was saying anything. Generations of people have known. And one of my friends was talking about her mother being terminally ill and the predator in her family wanted to come and see her, although he was the person who was preying on her when she was a child, and the way in which that silence allows that behavior to continue and allows that abuse to continue. And so I love that you spoke about the ways in which it visit, visits us in our own lives because I, I genuinely believe that outside of the scope of media or what we see in pop culture or what we see with the person like a Harvey Weinstein or a Bill Cosby, it's really looking at how the pathology of that within a family, how that echoes and mirrors what we see in our bigger, broader pop culture conversations. Yeah, I mean, that's, that strikes me as, as, really, as really key, right? That uh, in, in some way, when it's played out on NBC News, when it's played out in The New Yorker, uh, it's a pathology that becomes visible because, precisely because it's so outrageous, because so many people had to look away. But of course, we're all familiar with versions of this where it's less people, it's, uh, the, you, know, uh, it, it, uh, you know, some, you know, maybe children, you know, and, and so it, it's, it becomes much, much trickier. And it's a really interesting thing that in some way um, we, we may be looking at uh, at kind of an extension of something that operates in American families or in families more generally uh, or, or in intimate uh, uh, settings anyway, but it sort of becomes noticeably pathological when it is you know, something like the Weinstein Company where you really think, my goodness, there's a, 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 a section of this business devoted to cover up. I mean, that's just, who, if, if that's your job description, if you're like, what do you do for them? It's like, oh, you know, uh, that's that's really when you get to a, a level of, of where, where sort of the the madness kind of becomes obvious. But but it's true that um, uh, what allows people to do it is certainly that they that they um, practice it elsewhere. Um, so do you think that that's uh, something that uh, that can and and has even has the potential to shift, or is that something that uh, in some way, will will uh, something like Me Too will have at best a a, a sort of momentary um, success in tempering? I, I think that there are, that's like a both and answer mm -hmm. for me. I think on on one end, what's always alarming to me is that, as you said, the madness is very obvious, and yet people ask how could this happen or why is this happening or, or specifically in my own family, <laughs> why are they picking on Bill Cosby, right? Even though it's clear and obvious that there's a pattern of behavior here that needs to be called out. And it's, it's uh, specifically, and I always speak about within my own family, the fact that I'm always the lone voice saying, mm, Bill Cosby should be in jail. <laughs> He's exactly where he should be. Um, but the fact that, that we could have conversations about, oh yeah, there was this predator operating in our own family, but when it comes to someone who is wealthy and who is famous and who is on a national stage and who's donated millions of dollars to HBCUs, of which I'm an uh, alumni of one, that they could also operate in this way, as if we cannot see that people are multifaceted, that you can do all of this good and be awful and be a monster and visit pain upon whoever your victims are. So I think in, in that instance, until we kind of penetrated on, the, on your interpersonal level in, among your friend groups within your families, kind of shifting the mindset around these conversations, not a lot of change is going to happen in your day-to-day -day personal life. I think on a broader level and what the Me Too movement is really about, one, it, it started to specifically focus on black girls, which I think is important in schools among, around sexual assault and providing black girls with the resources that they need. I think given the fact that Tarana Burke is now a national figure, that part of that work is being done. Like she now has the resources to do that level of work. But in terms of sustaining it, 
for these broader national Hollywood figures? Uh, probably not, because they're already trying to do comebacks, and it's only been a year. Right. And are getting the opportunities to be on stages, to, to meet with agents, to get a new lawyer and a new manager to, to help you guide the next phase of your career as if this is just a hiccup to get over. I don't think that part of it, the, the being excoriated publicly and then being able to rebound, that part is not going to end or stop. Yeah, that strikes me as, as, uh, as, as really central, right? That, that one of the things about rumor, one of the things about, about whisper networks is the impermanence, right? The, 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 it's an institutional familial memory that <clears throat> lives and dies with the people who keep it alive. Um, and, and what we see, what's really striking, what we see is that, that these powerful figures uh, brought down by Me Too um, seem to speculate that they can in some way, that they can count on kind of the public having a worse memory than the Whisper Network, uh, which, uh, and, and the funny thing is I'm not even sure they're wrong, right? I mean, like there is, again, in, in the Weinstein case, there are examples of people saying, well, don't, don't, don't get him mad at you because even if he has to go for a few years, he'll be back, right? Uh, and I mean, who, who are we, you know, I, I, I tend not to, vote, not to bet against, uh, against uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of logic. Uh, uh, you know, I think that there is something, so there's something very fascinating about, uh, about how um, the, the, the Whisper Network um, is actually um, less forgetful than, than, you know, the official, the official record in some ways, right? Well, the official record is sort of deliberately right. <laughs> forgetful. Um, and when we talk about, I think we want to talk about si the silence, the institutional silence, and sort of the official silence. And there's a couple of motivations for the way that that silence gets perpetrated by individual actors, like loyalty to the terrible family member or um, a sense of looming doom for a giant media conglomerate uh, that will face you know, consequences in its future endeavors. And there's also a lot of um, incentives to keep quiet that are a little more of the stick than the carrot. Um, people don't go to HR because 75% of, according to the EEOC, 75% of people who report sexual harassment in their workplace then are retaliated against. Right. Um, that's 75%. That's, you know, that's much more likely to happen to you than not. And you know, there's similar empirical studies about the tendency of police to ignore or further abuse uh, victims of sexual violence who come forward. So the, the Whisper Network exists not merely because of uh, cowardice or betrayal. It exists as a, like, as a means of survival right. uh, and a means of supplementing the institutional avenues for reporting, which are like quite, quite spectacular failures uh, and very dangerous ones with this unofficial, illegitimate, but, but frankly much more effective uh, reporting mechanism that, that poses as a sort of clandestine, uh, unofficial alternative. And far more mobile in its own way, right? I mean, uh, able to adjust, able to follow people around in ways in which the, the legal system, for one thing, can't, right? Uh, this is something that in, <clears throat> in academia, right, is, is uh, uh, I, I'm not sure to what extent our HR files follow us from university to university. I'd have to look into that. But I, I believe uh, they're not particularly mobile. Um, internet comments are forever, right? That's the, that, can be, that can be a very important thing for, to follow someone from one place uh, to another. Um, so I think that I think that's that that's part of it too, right? That there's this kind of um, this need to be mobile, where the immobility of the legal system often feels like it's intended to produce exactly the kinds of results that you're you're talking about. Uh, the other thing that that I think we talked about a little bit is, is to what extent the Whisper Network um, works with community. Um, mm -hmm. And is it is it a community building thing, or is it is it uh, you is it does it tend to be more reactive? How, how does it how do we think it works? It's a it's a form of community building, in my opinion. The very first whisper network that I can ever think of is the Negro Motorist Green Book, 
that's not the official title, but essentially this book that went from black family to black family to tell them where they could go in the South, like gas stations you could stop at, hotels you could rest in, places where you could be, restaurants where you would be served, places where you would be where you would be safe. And if you wanted to travel on the road with your family, more than likely if you encountered racism or encountered white supremacists who inflicted violence upon you and your family, the actual official channels in which you could report that will result in nothing at that point. But if there was a way to be preemptive and say these are the places, these are all the places you can travel in these particular regions in which you will be safe, that is a form of community building, especially if it's not, um, it took a long time for that to be published through an official channel. It was literally being passed along from family to family. And so in that respect, I think it's, it's uh, a form of community building. And then it's also a form of protecting yourself right. in, in many respects. I was um, just speaking with you both about a story I read literally today, like this reported feature about um, both the fader and vice and them having one specific guy who ran them both at a certain point, or ran a vertical at Vice, but then was running content at The Fader, both music magazines. Um, and people knew, like the, the, the thing that kept coming up over and over within this story is, if you go to a party with this guy, you do not have more than three drinks. If you go to a party with this guy, you do not have more than three drinks. And that's something that's passed along from employees that have been at this company for a long time to employees who are new there. So in that way, it's, it's reactionary in that something had to have happened for that conversation to even begin and for it to be passed along. But on the other end, it's preemptive because you're trying to protect newer employees who are coming in from meeting that same fate, especially if you know like an HR department is not going to do anything to stop it, you know? Yeah, I was thinking about this earlier when I was sort of trying to position what I was going to say tonight to you folks in, in the context of my own work. And like most people who know my work know me because I made this um, Google document in October of 2017 that was sort of a crowdsourced whisper network um, that was like sort of anonymous and editable and shareable. Um, and the whole idea was that it was going to be a like sort of stopgap replacement measure for the failures of uh, HR departments at places like Vice and the Fader that were um, pretty systemically and, and universally ignoring uh, some like really pretty heinous behavior going on um, by their staff. And so this thing that I created went wildly viral beyond my wildest dreams because I think there was a, a great hunger for this kind of ability to uh, share people's experiences without fear of retribution uh, and sort of that enabled by the internet was, was wildly efficient in ways that uh, were a little bit terrifying to me. And, but it had uh, precedence because I was, when I made this document, I was inspired by sex workers who compile bad date lists, uh, which are often online and also anonymous and crowdsourced and meant to protect people who, um, cannot go to the police because, for all the reasons that other survivors cannot and also because they are additionally criminalized. And when, and it's also, you know, there's also precedent in a bathroom, literally a bathroom wall at Brown University um, where in 1990 students started writing down the names of their rapists and the administration sent in a custodian to paint it over and the next day they all wrote them down again. Uh, and it was, you know, widely condemned in the New York Times. But um, these, these networks are, they have a very long history. They are, it's a model of community building and sharing that's like very, it's quite scalable and it's um, accessible to people who are very vulnerable as well as people who have a lot of privilege and power. Uh, and it also, I think, testifies to a shared sense of endured injustice, like our, the, compul the compulsion of our silence is wrong, is what you say when you compile a whisper network. And it's a, it's a kind of testament to community power, right? Like we do not have to be alone and helpless yeah. in our suffering. We can accumulate this information into something like a green book or into something like a bad date list and we can use that for a kind of mutual self-protection. And, it, and it, it, it does it by reestablishing the exact kinds of patterns that gaslighting is meant to destroy, right? It's saying 
this keeps happening around this individual, right? Uh, and and where where so much energy uh, in 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 the sort of public um, discussion around these things. I was like, well, what if it was just this one time? What if it's what? What if you you know you imagined it? What if, right? And and in some way, the the I hadn't thought of the the, the Brown story for for a long time, but that's of course. Um, <clears throat> there, it's also about just the repetition of names, right? It, it just the fact that um, that um, these names come up again and again. And the the uh, uh, Megan Tui and Jody Cantor book about uh, about their investigation into Harvey Weinstein. Uh, there, there's this moment where they sort of realize they 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 speak to someone who describes her encounter with Harvey Weinstein in exactly the same terms as everyone else that she's never met, and they realize in that moment they can't tell her. You know, by the way, just so you know, you didn't, you know, we, we understand that there are 50 other people who've, who've told us in those words what they went through, right? But as journalists, that's not, that, that they can't do that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so this, this, the way the pattern, establishing the pattern and sort of pointing it out, so the, the way the Whisper Network becomes kind of a knowledge production, I think is, is really kind of fascinating, but it gets to this question of, does technology change it, right? You have the, you have the shitty media man list, you have the green book. Uh, does the fact that like I can hold the book in my hand, does it that I can be shared the Google Doc, does that um, put it on a different level or is it just, does it make it, you know, and how, in what way does it, does it change it? Mm. I mean, it makes it go quite a bit faster. Right. Um, right. Is it just accelerated, I guess, would be the, yeah. I think it's, I mean, social media creates some connections that would not be there without it, but largely it's mim- mimicking other kinds right. of social uh, networks that happen between people. So I, I largely think that social media tends to scale up and speed up human behaviors that are happening anyway. I completely agree. I also think it, uh, it, allows, um, it allows people who may otherwise never have had an opportunity to connect to form mass consensus around an idea. And so what I particularly, and I of course visit the Google Doc because I was working in media at the time. I'm also a nosy person, but that's <laughs> aside from that. Um, it, it allowed um, people to kind of affirm each other because so often when you endure a trauma, specifically if you endure a trauma with people who are in a position of power over you or can dictate your career, in many instances, it creates silence and it, it enforces stigma and it isolates you. And so if you're able to see via a Google Doc or via what people are saying on Twitter to each other or through DMs or group chats or however you communicate with the people who people you otherwise may not have been able to connect to, it allows you to affirm each other and to validate that experience in a way that may not have been possible on that scale before. Yeah, Adrian, you spoke earlier to the ways that um, sort of silencing mechanisms of patriarchy form this gaslighting Mm -hmm. effect and how whisper networks can establish really just pattern recognition. Um, And I think that was, that's something very, it's very potent and powerful in these kinds of networks that when you hear about other people having similar experiences, it not only makes you feel less alone, it makes you feel a lot less crazy. Right. And, and, and gives you a greater moral claim. You know, it's no longer just your word against his. Yeah, and I think it's something that, one of the really interesting things in, 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 the, in the moment when that kind of information then becomes, sort of, goes into journalism, basically, it does strike me as um, the fact that, of course, it's shadowed with the earlier information, right? It's the, uh, but in some way, it's not, that information's not allowed to be pointed out, right? Um, <clears throat> that, you know, uh, I mean, there's the example of, of, uh, of the, 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 the New Yorker's um, um, attempt to sort of uh, resurrect Al Franken's career, right? Where sort of like you, pick out, you pick the one thing and you say, so, well, how much, how much water does this really hold? But then you forget that there's this entire background of like, well, this, all these other strangely similar stories, um, and and with with many of these these cases when you know with with uh, with Weinstein with with Louis C.K. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the stories that were reported out are very clearly subtended by this kind of whisper network. And yet, um, it's very striking that, like, it took for me, who I feel like I follow media pretty closely, it took for me the books by the journals written about the, the process to actually understand that, to say, like, okay, there are behind that, obviously, 10 p cases that they didn't go with because they, there was something, you know, they couldn't quite substantiate it or it wasn't, they thought, well, this person uh, may not want that out there or whatever. Um, so, but, but, but of course, one reads it and thinks, oh, well, there are three accusers. And, well, no, there aren't. Uh, there is an entire Google Doc behind this, except that, or, you know, a ver either a real Google Doc or the, you know, the, the, the traditional Google Doc um, uh, um, of, of just the Whisper Network. And, and it sort of solidifies what a journalist feels they can, they can report out. Yeah, three accusers should be read as like three accusers who told people in real time who the reporters were uh, able to contact and who also were willing right. to uh, endure tremendous potentially professional consequences to go on the record. So three accusers is the, the absolutely most rigorously uh, defined three accusers, and they are, you know, often in stand-in for a sea of other women. But I do, I, Adrian, you touched on something that I want to sure. get back to, which is this um, sort of equality of testimony, yeah. um, where like we have, you know, I'm thinking of this one cover of New York Magazine, like maybe 2016 or 2017, and it was all the Bill Cosby accusers. And they were tiny because there were something like six, 60 mm -hmm. of them, 60 who have come forward. Um, and they had to give that guy a mistrial because <laughs> uh, they had a hung jury on the first time. Right. Um, and that was a situation where the accused man, the perpetrator, had so much power and credibility and so much like accumulated public goodwill that his word was essentially worth at least 60 women's word. Um, but then you have the reverse situation, and you mentioned the Al Franken piece. The easiest way to ruin a dinner, by the way, is to ask somebody what they think about Al Franken. Um, I was hesitant. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh no. Um, <clears throat> the New Yorker piece about Al Franken was about one of his accusers who may have had political motivations and it was sort of casting doubt on the way this woman told her story and to whom and uh, sort of tried to undermine her credibility while not really grappling with the fact that the guy had eight other, now eight at the time, I think seven other accusers um, who were again all telling fairly similar stories. Um, so her credibility, like all of their dependent credibility fell down like this domino set when one person's fell. Um, so that the forces of patriarchy are very good at uh, making men seem unduly credible and women seeming mm -hmm. not very credible. Um, Miranda Fr Fricker calls this testimonial injustice. It's about who we consider um, reliable speakers and reliable knowers, and that's, that tends to be men. Mm. In, in that same vein, as, as you're speaking, immediately I think about R. Kelly. Right, yeah. who, yeah. if you know a single black girl from Chicago, ask her about R. Kelly. Nearly all of them, or people that they know, or their friends, have a story about R. Kelly, particularly hanging out this one McDonald's by his high school where he preys on, on black girls, right? And that is not a new story. This is a story that has existed for decades. Nearly every black girl I've met from Chicago either has that story or knows somebody who has that story. And yet it takes a trial, it takes being acquitted, it takes a lifetime documentary, it takes a journalist, in this case Dream Hampton, being very diligent about digging into R. Kelly's background and bringing together this group of, I mean, incredible women who have survived some of the worst traumas visited upon any single person. And then, it's only, and then, that he is facing charges now and could possibly, hopefully, knock on wood, go to prison for a very long time. But within that, if you, and it's, a, it's the same thing about Al Franken, never go to a black family dinner and bring up R. Kelly, because it's going to, it's going to split directly down the middle. Despite all of the evidence, despite the fact that he has 
so many victims at this point that you couldn't put them on a newspaper page one, like a 1A page or a magazine cover. And yet there's still this culture of disbelief specifically around him and Bill Cosby in black families. It's, it's not only sad, but it just goes to show how little people who have been victimized are believed. If the person who victimized them is powerful or has a lot of goodwill or has done a little bit to help a perceived um, disempowered black community, how far they can go and continue to abuse. I mean, as, as you were as you were talking, I was thinking of the, the the what what belief at that point means, and it really starts being less about sort of the way a jury believes someone. It's more about a religious belief, almost, right? In the sense that I, I sometimes want to ask when you know when when the the, the, the truthers that are out there for some of these uh, these uh, these truly sort of staggeringly uh, 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 large scale cases, where like. What is it that you think actually happened, right? How did this, what's the other side to this, right? Um, how would enough people to fit on, a, so many people that you could not fit them on a magazine cover, how would they, you know, if, if it were to turn out that he was innocent, what would that have looked like, right? And it's like, it, 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 it's, it's a science fiction story, right? It's, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's almost impossible uh, for anyone to describe what that, sequence of events should have looked like, and yet it is sort of held up as this kind of, as the reasonable position, right? And so I do think it's really interesting how we use belief in that sense, because it isn't about sort of, I judge you credible, it's more about, I must, though, I must think this is true no matter how much un evidence to the contrary I'm gonna be given, right? Uh, I, I find that really fascinating. I kinda, I kinda wonder where the article of belief is in that kind of situation, like you have, I'm thinking of Brett Kavanaugh, right, um, who has, you know, a pretty, a very, very legitimate, <laughs> um, credible accuser who, like, sort of checks all of the boxes of the things that are horrific uh, sexist media demands that survivors be um, and is still widely disbelieved. And I think, like you, you were saying, the only other explanation is that there's a wild conspiracy right. Hatched I, 20 I, years ago and right. planned over. I don't think that's what they're thinking. I think what's, what they're thinking is some version of, you know, sexual harm is not real harm. Right. Um, like, this doesn't really count. You weren't really hurt by this. Right. So please shut up and go away. Or, like, let's all be adults. And, you know, the adult reasonable thing to do, again, is to ignore and dismiss women's right. pain. Yeah. I think there's also a belief that survivors gain something from coming right. forward, that there is a benefit. It's almost as if, as someone who exists in media literally all the time, there's almost a, a media's failure to account for or to expose or reveal what happens to survivors when they come forward. Like there isn't, like, okay, uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford came forward. What has happened to her now? And of course, she shies away from press, and rightfully so. But what, what has become of her life since coming forward against one of the most powerful men in the United States? The, the failure to do that makes it seem as if, if you accuse this person, and it's always when there's a, a civil case attached to it, right. if you gain it all monetarily from from something that has been visited upon you, there's always this assumption that there's so much to be benefited or gained by bringing someone who is powerful and wealthy down. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the, the Weinstein accusers, right? I mean, like, it's a long list of people who had their lives ruined, right? And, and whose who's, uh, ultimate, you know, some of them did get, and sign NDAs for some settlement, but, like, you know, if you, if you count that towards how much you make in the entertainment industry for even in even five years, right? It's it, it, obviously no one would do this to, uh, you know. It's not a, it's not a money making proposition. I guess one one place I, I was I was wondering about uh, one thing I was wondering about there was is is just the question of um, the role of the legal system in in all this. Uh, that is to say, on on the one hand, um, we have uh, it, it does have this this effect. Of, of delegitimizing actually accusations precisely when they uh, they move uh, when you end up choosing the correct legal channels, 
uh, the appropriate legal channels. On the other hand, I'm also always interested, in, and this is something that what, this is the moment where, where these media stories sort of uh, resonate for me uh, as, a, as an academic, is often these kinds of phantomic, I, this idea that if we make public what this person did, we're gonna get sued for defamation, right? Mm. And, and um, it, it, it appears to me that, that that's largely fictive, right? That it's that people do not, accused uh, perpetrators do not successfully bring these suits very often, but institutions are super good at imagining that they might be brought and therefore we should really stop talking about this now, right? Um, what is the role of the legal system in all this? I mean, I'll say that a defamation suit doesn't have to be successful when it's brought against right. you to cause you a lot of stress and cost you a lot of money. Right. Um, so I don't, I, I do think people use this, or institutions can use the threat, the supposed threat of, le of litigation to um, get out of doing something you don't want to do. Because what you don't hear that often is like, oh, we got to fire this, you know, grabby editor because otherwise all the women in the office are going to sue us for right. a hostile work environment. Um, you hear, like, we can't print that this guy is sexually abusive uh, because then he'll sue us for defamation. Yeah. I, I also think in that when we talk about the role of the legal system, immediately there's this brilliant book by a historian named Danielle McGuire called At the Dark End of the Street that recast um, the civil rights movement specifically to focus on how the violence inflicted on black women in the South was the true catalyst for the civil rights movement. Outside of the way that it's framed uh, publicly that Rosa Parks sat down on a bus. She was tired, <laughs> okay, she was exhausted, and she sat down. It really reveals the strategy behind how Rosa Parks got there. And one of the ways in which Whisper Networks functioned back then, at the time Rosa Parks was a field secretary for the NAACP, and she was sent specifically to places where there were rumors about a black woman being sexually assaulted. Literally, usually, 90% of the time by someone in law, law enforcement, simply by a police officer or someone who stopped them on the side of the road and sexually assaulted them, and now they feel like they have no legal recourse to come forward. So she was legitimizing the Whisper Network by going and documenting this happened to this person, this is kind of mass consensus around in these different places, these are happening to these different black women, and we need to create some sort of some sort of strategy and organize around ending this violence. And the way in which to do that is to shift every system to be more equitable. So not just make it so that, you know, if, if a police officer violates a black woman, and there was one, only one case that was one in that, but not only will that person get legal recourse, but also we have to be able to get on buses and we have to be able to go to schools and we have to be seen um, in kind of, it's almost like seen as, as worthy right. of legal recourse in order to shift all of these systems. So I immediately thought about Rosa Parks there. But also, so much of predatory behavior happens within institutions that are designed to protect us. It's not a safe um, position for a sexual assault survivor to be in to go and have a rape kit because there's a possibility that rape kit will never be tested as so many of us know. There's a large possibility that that person will not be believed. If you have read Chanel Miller's Know My Name, there's a very powerful, like right in the beginning of that book about what that process is like in documenting a sexual assault. It is not something that serves in many respects the person who is being victimized. And so in that instance, whisper networks become a way to not only legitimize your experience, possibly have it documented in a way in which you will get whatever it is that you are seeking, but also um, kind of serve as a, almost like a healing process for yourself because you know going through a proper legal system may or may not um, bestow that on you. Yeah, there's, um, I'm, I'm really grateful for Yvette's point about uh, sort of the dangers posed by law enforcement. And there's also just a, I want to also shift to like what happens when you get a lawyer, which is that you have to pay a lawyer a lot of money. Um, plaintiff work tends to be cheaper than defendant work because plain, lawyers who are representing plaintiffs work on commission, but you still have to pay 
a retainer and you have to pay a lot of court fees and it's a financial burden that is like really not insignificant and it's not easy to get like overcome and then you go through a very slow legal process that involves a lot of uh, sometimes quite hostile interrogations from defense lawyers and it's just it's re-traumatizing every couple of weeks when you have to go in and do this and talk about it yet again uh, and explain yourself yet again. Um, and I think there is a reasonable, like not only just like distrust of law enforcement, but reasonable like calculation that going through the justice system is prohibitively expensive and also that it would prohibit the beginning of, of healing. healing. Well, and that the very thing that gives the Whisper Network its force, right, the pattern, is the first thing that's going to be really hard to establish for, for any part of the legal system, especially if it's a private suit, right? I mean, to, to, uh, uh, to what extent that's admissible is, of course, uh, you know, that, that there's a high bar for that. Yeah, I think that's I, I, one place I, I, I'm realizing we've, we've been using the rumor Whisper Networks um, as the kind of uh, as kind of the somewhat the the self organized spontaneous um, uh, way in which one can get healing community power if it's withhold, withheld. At the same time, I do think um, we probably also want to talk about rumor as the thing that does withhold can withhold power, right? Because the interesting thing is, of course, that. Um, and it hadn't sort of occurred to me until just now, but of course, a lot of these, a lot of the delegitimizing functions that are being relied on and that can make it, in fact, into the justice system, right, are about are ultimately about rumors, right? I mean, the accuser is crazy. The accuser got money. The accuser got right. I mean, these are those. That's a whisper network all its own. Um, I, I wonder if we could sort of talk about is this sort of rumor versus rumor, or are they different? Um, I do think that like when we talk about gossip and rumor, it's important not to like even though these uh, these forces can be like very threatening and subversive to like power hierarchies that tend to like keep marginalized people down, they can also be exploited by those power hierarchies. Like this is not a pure counter discourse that is like only a force of good in the world uh, because. Rumor is, as you as you mentioned, sort of at the top of the talk, it's like a very foundational way about how we live, and it does get into these institutions, which means it can be used by these institutions uh, with like great efficiency, right? So, Mina Suvari declines to have sex with Harvey Weinstein, and suddenly she's difficult to work with. Right. Uh, or Rose McGowan go, comes forward about uh, an alleged rape by, I think, I guess I still have to say alleged, alleged rape by Harvey Weinstein. And um, Harvey Weinstein has his lawyer to tell her publicist to plant a story that she's crazy. This is a story from, this is an anecdote from Catch and Kill, yeah, yeah. I believe. Um, so delegitimizing the source of, like delegitimizing the accuser's position as a knower is like a very common Tactic. Uh, it's a very, it's a very usual way how it was like rumor is used uh, because reputations do. Like this is the whole power of the whisper network, right? Like somebody's reputation influences how you interact around them and the kinds of choices you make about them, and it can also uh, do that in ways that harm people who don't deserve it. Yeah, in that in that same way too, I think the way in which we use gossip. And even the word itself right. evokes a connotation of, when I immediately think of gossip, I think of a gossip blog. I think of the shade room or a TMZ. Or it becomes a way to undermine. When you reduce a credible allegation, an accusation against someone who has harmed someone else, when you reduce it to gossip in that way, it becomes a way to delegitimize it and undermine it and make it seem as if it's, it's simply a rumor with no weight or no teeth. To it, and that in itself is is not only harmful to the person who has been harmed, but if you're trying to stop a a predator who has been doing this for a long time, 
reducing it in that way as if it's something that is up for debate or if there's two sides to the argument, like it's an objective thing. Um, just it, it makes the process longer if you're trying to, to stop a predator. And I suppose as I think about the word gossip too, it's, it's about it's the thing we spread there's a presumption that it is spread without a purpose almost, right? right? And, and, and whereas, of course, a whisper network, when we call it whisper network, it's like, no, this has a very, very serious purpose. Uh, it, it, it is stepping in where other forces can't or won't. Um, but yeah, calling it gossip, of course, becomes this, uh, as he's saying, this is something people do because they're bored or because they have nothing better to do or um, because they're mean-spirited or whatever. It's, it, it sort of almost doesn't matter, right? Um, whereas whereas the, the Whisper Network, as we're describing it here, obviously is all about, it has a, has a deep seriousness of purpose. Can I actually hop on this? Because destigmatizing the word gossip is one of my bugaboos. I promise I won't take too long. Is when the word gossip was introduced to English in like early modern period, like roughly the 13th, 14th century, it actually just meant a female friend. Um, mm -hmm. It was a combination of God and Sib, which was like sibling sister. So it meant godparent or the people who were in the room with a woman when she's giving birth, which are all women. And it was sort of an a interchangeable noun for any kind of close female intimacy. Um, and it got demonized at around the same time that the um, artisans and labor guilds started excluding women and forcing them back into the home. So like this demonization of women's intimacy was like very tied up with the advent of capitalism. Uh, Sylvia Federici has done fantastic work on this. Um, and so women's talk was labeled as malicious and labeled as um, against the prevailing order, like labeled as like disobedient mm -hmm. in a way that I think like still, we still really carry along with us. This idea that if women are talking intimately together, they must be doing something wrong or nefarious. Uh, whereas like, as we've seen, like they're actually usually doing something that is quite central to community building and like mutual accountability. Yeah, and then you get this, the, the interesting kind of connection to, to, um, to professionalism then. I, was just, I must say I wasn't aware of the, the guild part. And, and there's something really interesting in terms of uh, uh, that, that gossip is also something that, of course, sort of has, is not supposed to have a, pl have a place in the workplace, right? It is sort of, it is of the home, it is of the family, it is of of uh, intimate acquaintanceship, ultimately. And, and, um, and uh, and, and yes, yeah, so there, there's, there's a kind of, um, there, there's also, I think we carry that with us too, this, this part of it, that we sort of, um, that, that uh, one is supposed to feel bad for, for spreading gossip at work, basically, uh, and, and, uh, it, and, and it's very unclear, uh, and that's very much independent of what is accomplished by it. Yeah, right, but I do wonder a, bit, a little bit about like, whose knowledge gets demonized, like when you're, like when a woman does it, it's like spreading gossip about a coworker, and when a man does it, it's like he's demonstrating sense. his expertise of the field. You know, um, <laughs> I mean, I'm being a little bit reductive I, and simplistic here to make my yeah. point, but it's um, the kind of knowledge and how legitimate it is and how legitimate its distribution is depends a lot on on who the knower and the speaker yeah. is. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, by the by the same token. Um, uh, communication between men at work often is made more serious than it than it ultimately ends up being, right? I mean, I think that's I think the two are are absolutely are absolutely um, you know uh, are, are sides of the same coin. It seemed to me. Agreed. I think it also then becomes a way of silencing. If if you have multiple employees, most of whom identify as women or are women. If, for whatever the reason, they are talking amongst each other about one particular person, it is very rare that that person is penalized in any way. Right. Because they're, they're coming together and organizing in many respects around this particular person or group of people and bringing it to a, a function of a corporation like an HR department. When that happens, it's immediately dismissed because it's seen as gossip. Like it's treated as if 
it's it's not legitimate. And they are attempting to come together with, without even thinking about what is gained. What what are you going to gain? What is this group of people or this single person gaining from coming forward about someone within their workplace who is, I mean, it's a spectrum of what I call indignities from just being disrespectful in a meeting to grabbing people to, I mean, it's just a spectrum of behavior. But when it's brought even by one person or a group of, of people, it's, it's often... Um, dismissed in that way and it's used under almost an umbrella of it's just gossip it's just rumor right yeah i mean i think i think just exactly a, also the idea of it as an umbrella term right that 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 there's there, there's a uh there's a, too much focus on who's doing the talking and not enough focus on what kind of talk it is because of course people could also get together and indeed just gossip but uh but it's but but just because these particular people are talking does not mean that it's that kind of talk, right? And I think that's, uh, that, that has always struck me also in, in, in the reporting out of, of, of these allegations, that, that, um, that, that the, the ways, pathways by which the information traveled uh, seem to matter a great deal, right? And, and seem, to, seem to matter more almost than the actual information that was doing the traveling. Yeah, there's, a, um, there's this idea that like, there is a way of talking that legitimizes the information being passed on or makes it more likely to be factually true. So like if you're in this discursive mode where you're very dispassionate and uh, I don't know, like stern and like uh, non-intimate and formal, like this makes the information that you, is contained in your, in your speech and your writing to be uh, probably closer to the truth. And there's actually nothing that I found about intimacy or um, like even playfulness that is like necessarily opposed to reason. Um, I think like it's very interesting that we think of the way we talk as being indicative of something central about what we're talking about, which I'm, I'm not always sure exists in this case. And I mean, and, and in and in journalism, that gets compounded again because, uh, of course, a lot of journalism has sort of moved um, into discursive spaces like that, where it's meant to signal, "Hey, this is you know, I, I, I speak the way you speak around the water cooler or whatever." But uh, th 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 that, of course, doesn't change the kind of information that's being conveyed. And then, you know, uh, the, the 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 role. I mean, it's, it's striking, right, that a lot of these accusations start in these kind of free, uh, sort of freewheeling spaces where people, you know, Twitter, where people can just kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, reply, where people can, can sort of almost make a joke out of something or whatever. And then but they, but they end up in, right, I mean, the CK allegation first sort of got the official airing that now we can all talk about this from the New York Times, right? And then uh, uh, Weinstein, New York Times, New Yorker, right? It's like, it's really striking that, you know, it really starts on one end of that spectrum and then ends up on the very, on the very opposite end of that spectrum. And, and really only once uh, it, it is in this extremely, right, once it has the, uh, the umlauts on the E's that you do you know like okay now we can all we can all talk about this now the New Yorker has sort of mentioned it. Yeah, I think too in in that respect it's the same thing that just happened with the article I was talking about that I read um, about the the man at the fader and at Vice. It started as someone just literally tweeted about it, and the headline is something like nobody cared about this guy until women started tweeting about it. It's something you know designed to, to get Google going, <laughs> to, get, to get people to click. But beyond that, it's true that it starts on this kind of informal, like right now I'm seeing a lot of conversation, very informal on Twitter about Jeff Goldblum, like a very informal people just talking about it. I guarantee it's going to become a New York Times story, New Yorker story. It's going to be broken somewhere and the allegations at that point carry the credibility now as if they were not credible if it just exists. Right. On, on social media. I wonder a bit about like this cre sense of credibility and like you talking about how, okay, well now we're allowed to discuss this. Right. There's a sense of like legitimation and seriousness that happens when these rumors get like laundered through um, 
the reporting process and sort of affirmed in this institutional way with the umlauts over the E's. But then like they start impacting our individual choices and behaviors way before that. Um, right. Like I first heard a weird rumor about Jeff Goldblum like maybe six months ago. Yeah. And then, you know, whenever I saw him, I was like, oh, you know, like his, and not like in some way where like I am going to write my righteous takedown of <laughs> Jeff Goldblum, who I heard this one rumor about, but in a way where like his work was now tainted with just the shade of discomfort. Mm. Um, and that kind of, that kind of like change is happening yeah. all the time when we get this information. Like our, my, my emotional response does not wait for the New Yorker. Right. Right, in some way the, the Whisper Network is a reflection of that, is, is to say that there's something, right? It's a, there's, a, there's an aura, there's a nimbus, you know, there's there may not enough information yet, but there is this. Can I ask, I mean, and let me know if this, is, if, uh, if this uh, goes to, to uh, something unpleasant, but uh, in terms of when, when the, the Google Doc went as viral as it did, um, you also sort of did end up, when you realized that it was going to become clear who made it, uh, did you also sort of think about, oh, wow, what's the, how, do I need to get to the, e on, the umlas on the E kind of people now? Or, or did, was there kind of a, did you think, oh, God, this is a race towards legitimation at this point? Or else I'm... No, my first response was that I was going to get sued. Oh. I thought, my first instinct was that it was going to be not about the accusations on the document, but about the, the documents the, itself, yeah. which became true. True, yeah. But then there was there was an article that was gonna out you, right? And there was a, yeah. yeah. Um, so take you guys down a trip down, a trip down memory lane. <laughs> and again, um, <laughs> I made again. I made this document in October, twenty seventeen. It was online for about twelve hours. Um, I thought maybe a few of the women in my circles would see it and we would sort of like compile everything we knew and then thousands of people saw it and 74 men were named on it and 14 were uh, noted as like sort of serially violent predators through this like system on the document. Um, so about 12 hours later, I get news that BuzzFeed is gonna publish an article making the document's existence um, public in a formal institutional way as opposed to sort of like merely public in this uh, informal, Email. unauthorized way. Yeah, uh, so I took it down then and began preparing myself for litigation um, because it's totally legal to delete a document before you get sued. So I deleted everything. Um, and then three months later, I find out that my identity as a creator of this document is going to be published in a Harper's Magazine piece by Katie Royfe. Um, so I then had to, you know, either, I had, I had a very short amount of time uh, and I, I revealed my own identity in an essay for The Cut, which is part of New York Magazine. I'll note there, it's not always, I, I think we, when we have conversations like this um, in kind of public forums, we get very reductive about the gender of, of people who are involved in both the, the people who are victimized as well as the people who um, are doing the victimizing. There are a legion of women who do the work as well right. um, in terms of outing someone who created a list of, to, in, in which women were protecting, well, people were protecting other people, um, or who questioned the legitimacy of a movement like Me Too because of who it's targeting. And so I think it's important to, I, I'm glad that you mentioned the journalist there, that it's not just the work of these people in these C-level suites who are all right. rich white dudes, you know, rich white cishet dudes that it's, it goes beyond that, and that there are what a bitch has termed loophole women, is what we call them, who, who do that work on behalf of, of institutions to, to continue to delegitimize the narrative around harm. Right, and in that case, actually delegitimize the very, sh just the form, right? It's yep. not even about, you know, the, 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 it's not about even the content, it's about the idea of sharing this information. That's the thing that, that uh, 
that uh, they, they sort of kicked into high gear for. I mean, that's really, it's really remarkable to think about, you know, um, you know the, the amount of things that people can put online and, and it's fine, right? And, and you think about um, that the very possibility of creating, creating a space where this kind of thing might happen somehow and it makes you outable. I mean, I think that's, that's really kind of, that's really striking. And I, I, I guess I, I think we should probably open it up pretty soon. Um, in terms of, in terms of uh, the, the, the changes that are, that are coming now or the things that are happening now, I think, thought in, in terms of uh, the conversation, I, I might sort of close where we started, uh, sort of ask, um, do you see, um, do you see a sea change happening around uh, the way we transmit information from you know, the, 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 the whisper network to, uh, uh, to, well, media or to just uh, you know the the the, the uh, you know the corporate suite or something like that. Uh, ha are there are there changes coming? I'm asking this. Uh, th there, there's something so interesting in the in the um, Harvey Weinstein story about you realize how well that system worked until it didn't, mm -hmm. right? And and especially the 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 Cantor Tui book is really interested in how. How did that happen? I mean, some of it is about individual courage, and some of it is just about, um, and some of it is probably about his waning power to some extent. But there, but there is also just um, like there's there's one person at the Weinstein Company who sort of asks his daughter for advice, and she's like, "What the hell are you doing? You can't protect this guy, right?" Um, is there is there any reason to sort of think that this relation that this relationship between Whisper Networks and the sort of uh, the discourses that that in, in in which these things are taken seriously and acted on uh, is shifting fraying at all, or are we are are we going to be sitting here in ten years uh, asking the same questions? I, th you go first. I think um, history tends to exist on a pendulum, and we're just in a good upswing right now, right. but it's going to swing the other way at some point. I think right now it is, media is a, an industry of, um, <laughs> we mimic what other people do if we think it's successful. Right. And so as long as stories about people behaving badly are successful, if it wins you a Pulitzer, if it gets you at the top of a chart beat, <laughs> your analytics are, are amazing, they'll continue to produce these stories, but when it's no longer beneficial and no longer generates money, it's going to stop happening. And I think that is where the Whisper Network comes in because regardless of, of if those stories of people behaving badly or harming people, whether or not they become uh, 1A news or on every broadcast network and, and people in high positions of powers are talking about it, people who are being harmed by it will continue to talk about it amongst themselves. Right. And so I, I don't think we should get comfortable with the way specifically media is depicting sexual violence because that is going to change. It is going to shift. That is not going to continue in the long term. It is reliant on so many things and, and most of that is who is in rooms making decisions about what the coverage is going to be. Think about how long they have been pitching a story about Harvey Weinstein. How long did that take before? And then how long, once they got the green light to do the story, how long did it take from that moment to when it came out into yeah. the world? The process costs a lot of money and publications don't want to lose money. Um, the people who are implicated in it, are, are people who are within their own building in some respects, and so there's going to be blocking of that as well. And people don't want to look in the mirror and face themselves and grapple with the fact that they're complicit in a system that harms other people. And so I don't think it is wise to get comfortable or to think that this, uh, that this is going to be the status quo. The pendulum is eventually, and probably more quickly than we think, just to be, that's me being optimistic, to be honest. Oh it is going to shift the other way. Yeah, honestly, I share I share a vet's sense of um, impending anti-feminist backlash. You can see its beginnings already uh, in the media, in sort of this growing popularity of what I call like "fuck you" politics, or like politics designed to upset marginalized people and to right. take pleasure in doing so. Um, 
I'm not sure that I have a ton of faith in our institutions to get their act together and uh, to begin treating this information with the legitimacy that it deserves, but I have a ton of faith in women's continued insistence upon protecting one another. Uh, I've been really, like, just very grateful and, and struck by how much people are willing to endure to, to keep doing that. So for that, I, I, think we can be, I think we can be optimistic about the persistence of the Whisper Network. It's not going anywhere. It's a fantastic place to, to end this part of the conversation. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I think we'll uh, <coughs> get, to, get to some audience questions now. Um, ah, so this, is, this was sort of, this is a good question. But we, we may have addressed some parts of it. But I think that it's still worth thinking about. How do we counter self-proclaimed feminists, often publicly and institutionally acknowledged figures, who contribute to delegitimizing victims? They do more harm as feminists than, as, than a typical rich white dude. Um, uh, how, how can uh, uh, oh, I can't read this part? But I think the, I think the question is about how do we how do we uh, 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 deal with with the delegitimization from uh, sort of a a, um, uh, a self proclaimed feminist position? I am of the belief that you call people out. Mm. I okay. I I know we have these big conversations about cancel culture and the the um, usefulness. Of them, of, of the of a culture in which people pile on to an issue or pile on to an, a single individual, I oppose that. I do believe when you see harm, especially from other people who identify as feminists and claim to have feminist political commitments, because I think those are two separate things. Right. There are many people who identify as feminists who do not have feminist commitments and do not have feminist political commitments specifically. Like feminism is not an individual identity. You are part of a collective um, working toward um, equality and freedom and dismantling all of these systems, right? And so when you see someone who is claiming that identity but is not doing the work within a collective toward being equal, toward dismantling systems, you call that person out. I genuinely believe that. And you call them out as loudly as you can. And most likely that's online, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I think there's, there's value. I agree with Yvette that there's like a lot of value in directly confronting this. And there's a lot of value also in sort of meeting the argument <laughs> um, that they're making where it is because there's always a flaw in it. Mm -hmm. There's like been a ton of really just essential feminist work on victim blaming and on, um, I really think everybody should read Kate Mann's book. She has this coinage called Hympathy, uh, which is like a really um, valuable, it's a really cute neologism and also a really valuable like sort of theoretical tool uh, to apply. And like, if you can encounter what this like self-identified feminist is doing that is uh, hurting women, you can probably identify the rhetorical tools that they're using to do it and show how those are, in fact, not very feminist at all. Yeah. And I would add on there, that's why it's important to be well-read and to actually engage with feminist text. If you can get, I mean, many of them are expensive. You can't always get access to them. Many of them are behind paywalls. But if you can get access to actual feminist texts from feminist theorists, it's important to, to put that into your arsenal so you understand not only feminism as a lived experience, but as a, a theoretical tool, like feminist theory, and for me, black feminist theory specifically. Yeah, yeah do the reading, it really pays off. Yeah. yeah. So glad that we are there. <laughs> Uh, um, so this question is about the concept of moral shame. Do you think the concept of moral shame is dead? And I think that's a, it's a good question because uh, this, this uh, question you ask, you know, whisper networks are more about assigning blame and, and yeah, where, where, does, where does shame fit into all this? And I think we got to it a little bit when you talked about the sort of the fuck you position that like seems to might be the pendulum swing back. Is that, what, you know, what's the role in all this of, of shame? I always say I, I uh, spend a lot of time in specifically um, body politics, more specifically fat positivity. I spend a lot of time there, just mentally and in my own work. And I always say that you know, in the ways in which um, it is, 
we're in a, in a different time, but there was a time in which being publicly racist came with consequences, right? Where you could lose your job or you could be booted from your housing, which is not ideal, but it came with tangible consequences. I always say that I know fat phobia hasn't reached that place because you can be publicly fat phobic without a consequence. I think the shaming part of it in which if you embody these beliefs or if you harm another person, that there is an element of it where there's a tangible consequence is starting to happen. I mean, I, I think when we see the, the broader um, Me Too movement in terms of the people who have gone to jail, for instance, or are under indictment, who have been fired from movie sets, et cetera, you see it. But on our smaller day-to-day -day level, not really. Like schools still don't handle sexual assault very well. Yeah. Like there's, there's a level there in which the shame that comes along with it or that should come along with it where there are literal consequences for your behavior is not like we're not there yet. Yeah. We should be, but not, not quite. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a degree to which like our institutions, I think we've like identified here, like institutions are really failing to uphold the shared values of the people who actually make them up, right? Um, but like we are all in community with one another and we get to determine what those communities' values are. They're not like just something that happened to us, right? So if we want to start living in a university or a, a workplace or a culture more broadly that wants to say to perpetrators of sexual violence, like this is not okay, it's like, it is within our power to vocalize that position mm -hmm. and to slowly, slowly try to change it uh, so much that the institutions will eventually have to catch up. I, like, I don't want to like overstate that power because I, I always talk about patriarchy as like a boulder and feminists are trying to like chip away at it with like a spoon. Um, it's just, it's this very, very gradual, slow process that always sort of, um, you know, for every two steps forward, you have to take a step back. But I, I, I do think that we have, if you want perpetrators of sexual violence to be shamed, like it's, it's in your power to shame them. Mm -hmm. So um, this is another question that I think, um, I, I, it seems that the, the, uh, several of the questions are, are going in the direction of, of uh, having of saying something about Donald Trump. And I think it is, we are, are sort of, uh, we, ha we have sort of avoided that so far, but I think the shame question uh, went in that direction. And here, this, uh, this questioner asked, you haven't touched on Trump yet. Is he the ultimate failure of the Whisper Network? Uh, what do we make of his ability to get off scot-free every time? Uh, and then how do we not feel 100% demoralized, which I think that is a question we will not be able to fully, fully answer today. Um, but, the, um, but yes, the, the question of, of um, uh, what is the, is, is, is the Trump presidency sort of already the beginnings of, of uh, what's the relationship there to the, the Whisper Network? Um, uh, the, and I guess, you know, we, we could think about about uh, uh, sexual assault there, but we can also think about the fact that um, he, he that nothing that one finds out about him ever seems to be surprising. You always realize, yeah, I sure, like, oh, he said a racist thing. Like, I mean, I assumed he was racist. You know, like I just, you know, it, uh, uh, is that is that indeed is that sort of the 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 kryptonite of the Whisper Network? Is he the ultimate kryptonite? <sighs> Has anybody seen that Kiki Palmer meme that's like, <laughs> I don't know who this man is. He could be walking down the street. I wouldn't know a thing. That's how I feel about Donald Trump. I don't know who he is. Like, I don't, I don't. I have, uh... Goodness, I cannot believe that that person is the president of the United States. That is <laughs> odd. But I, what I will say is, is you can never discount um, the way in which wealth insulates people insulates people from consequence. I think that Donald Trump is, is literally the embodiment of that, of you come from a wealthy family, you have been insulated your whole life, you have been given access to every opportunity literally available, and still you abuse power. Right. And there, I don't think that Donald Trump is an outlier in that respect. I just think that he has gotten to a place in his presidency in which his behavior is so atrocious that it, it's normalized for us now. 
that there's nothing that you can ever say about him that surprises anyone who's paying attention. I don't think that that's a, a failure of whisper networks. I think that's a failure of institutions to hold him accountable right. until he got to that point. Because if, if you paid attention, and they're repeating it right now, I'm very critical of media as someone within media. If you watch the way that, that the media covered Donald Trump leading up to the 2016 election and watch the way that they are covering him now, it's literally repeating the same cycle. It is not until it gets to a level that's so gross that media has to say that it's gross before they say anything. And so if the only way that you have access to politics is through what you read and what you see, you could have gotten all the way to the actual presidency, like to inauguration day, and have no idea right. of half of the things that he has done. It is only now, like now that he's in power, and now that journalism swears that it holds power to account, even though they go to parties with the most powerful people, okay, even though that happens, it's only then that they are, are bringing to light all of these things. And so I, know, I think the Whisper Network still works. I think media, specifically newspaper media, broadcast media, has a lot of work to do. Otherwise, in November, I believe this, this could sound awful, but he's going to win again. Honestly, truthfully, when they say, is there a way to not be demoralized? There, there's no way other, to, <laughs> other than to live through it. And... I'll go there too. If he loses, he's not leaving. He's not going to get on a helicopter and just go away. If you think that's going to happen, like I have a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn, probably one, <laughs> <laughs> probably one in which uh, Donald Trump has crossed over. It's not happening. Yeah, I, um, I think with Donald Trump, you really see, I agree it's not a failure of the Whisper Network, it's a failure of institutions. Um, but our institutions are really not, I'm thinking about shame, our institutions are not capable, mm. really just not equipped to handle a whole, a whole lot of things, but really especially not somebody incapable of shame yeah. or who refuses shame with this, this yeah. like defiant, petulant, fuck you politics, like a right. ape throwing his shit at the wall. Um, and the thing is like, I, I would don't, I would never speak favorably of Richard Nixon. Richard, Richard Nixon re resigned out of shame right. and that, it, there's no guarantee that he would have been forced out of office right. otherwise. Um, this is not something, a, a gesture Donald Trump is ever going to make. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of what do you do when we have these institutions that are designed, I, I think, poorly to try and uh, sort out right from wrong when you have somebody who doesn't give a shit about right and wrong. It rolls off his back. Shame rolls off his back like water. It does not. It does not penetrate his skin at all. I mean, just bouncing off what you were just saying, I think that's it's so interesting that it is the it's the juncture between the whisper network and the media that's so interesting, right? <clears throat> if you, I, I had to review a couple of these these books about the Trump presidency, right? Sort of the Woodward fear and whatever, and it's really interesting that they keep trying to do sort of the Watergate reveal moment, where it's like it <laughs> turns out that it's like it was like there's nothing turns out. Everybody knew this, like, you know. It turns out he doesn't read the briefings. Really, I mean, who is, who is supposed to be shocked by this? And there is something interesting about, you know, um, with Weinstein, with Louis C.K., there was that moment when media had to s pretend to be surprised by something that they kind of already knew, right? But that moment, it turns out, for all its phoniness, had a kind of power. It was sort of like, we, it has now been printed here, and now we must all acknowledge how horrible this is, and that we had no idea this was happening, right? But as phony as that is, it appears to have had a certain power, and someone who is, as you say, can't actually fit into that mold at all, um, yeah, might indeed uh, pose this particular challenge, and and uh, on uh, in terms of in, in terms of how our media can cover that at all. I would I would add there. I think particularly with Hollywood figures, and you could probably treat Donald Trump as a Hollywood figure, but there's also the political mechanism there. Of the media has had, I would say at least at this point, like 15 gotcha moments <laughs> with the Donald right. Trump of he said this, he did this, look at what happened with Ukraine, look at this, look at this. But if there's not the political mechanism right. there in which that, um, those reveals spur people with the actual political power to remove him from office into action, it, it doesn't matter. The media can cover as much as they want and it right. wouldn't change anything. 
Um, so then th this question, I think, uh, brings up something really interesting. Uh, and it's about Me Too, but we could make it about Whisper Networks too, because I think it's, it's bringing up a really interesting um, comparison case. And it asks, does Me Too have room for, one, male survivors of abuse and, uh, and uh, survivors of childhood trauma or abuse within the family? Or would these people be better served by forming their own movement? And I think we can sort of ask about that in terms of Whisper Networks too, because of course that is a place where um, they function really differently, right? Uh, it does exist, but um, there precisely isn't sort of, uh, those survivors are left alone in ways that, that uh, a lot of the people we've been describing were not, right? Or, or Yeah, I mean, we, I'm still stuck on shame, sorry. But like, we talked a little bit about shame for perpetrators, but did right. not quite talk about shame for survivors, yeah. which is, I think, perhaps a much more uh, like socially potent force mm -hmm. and there's a particular shame around like of male survivors of, of sexual violence which I think is bound up often in, in a kind of homophobia um, or a, a sense of being emasculated by the abuse um, which is part of a kind of a um, an understanding of, of masculinity as being a sort of like imperviousness and invulnerability uh, that is, you know, sort of Im impossible for an actual human being to produce. Um, and then, you know, it's child with, with childhood sexual abuse, it's almost always um, committed by a family member, which adds a, a layer of darkness and shame and particularly unwillingness of the responsible adults to, to help. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would add there. Um, I think so often the way that we frame sexual assault is very binary in terms of it's a, a cisgender heterosexual male and a cisgender heterosexual female, and the media perpetuates that. And so I think that's a failure overall in terms of the way that we frame it binary, but it should not be. And then in in that same frame, like the the most visible, I guess male. Hollywood figure in this Me Too era is Terry Crews. And the way in which Terry Crews has been um, treated by even uh, fellow members in Hollywood of he should have fought back or he should have, um, he's this big tall guy, couldn't he have, have fought off um, being victimized in public, by the way, in front of his spouse, by the way. Like this happened in public. Um, so the way in which um, survivors who do not fit that binary so neatly are treated does make it difficult to bring forth that kind of collective reckoning that we've seen with like a Harvey Weinstein. I would say the closest we've come is probably Kevin Spacey and even in that the the level in which um, say a Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby the the knowledge around that is is on a different level entirely, almost a different stratosphere than the accusations against Kevin Spacey, and I think that is again a failure of the way that we frame sexual assault publicly. Yeah, I mean, I guess it'd be interesting to think also. I mean, just to the the questioner's point um, about um, uh, gay men versus versus uh, uh, heterosexual men, right? I mean, I think that. Uh, you know, Brian Singer is sort of a person that there was a kind of whisper network around him, right? Like, mm -hmm. that, like going to a party at his house meant certain things, and then like one should stay away from it. And that was one of those things that, like, as with, with Kevin Spacey, that sort of made the rounds, right? It was one of those things where one did did know on whatever level, right? And then it sort of showed up, I think, in that Billy Eichner show as like, you know, they would always make jokes about it, right? And so it was quite the same way that some of that Weinstein stuff sort of early seeped into the media. Um, but of course, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's within the gay community. And I think that, 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 does, that does make a difference here, I think that, um, and, and one of the questioners had, had a question about, you know, why they called whisper networks. And I think that, that we, we may have gl glossed over um, the gendered aspect of whispering, right? That that um, that uh, among gay men, you know, that, that kind of gossipy thing is kind of expected. But uh, but it but somehow you know there should be something else, something else you can do to fight back. And if you're you know if you're if you're if you're a straight guy, and I think that that's um, <clears throat> that's a really interesting, I think a really interesting kind of limit case here, interesting limit question. I guess the person I was thinking of was Michael Jackson. That would be someone mm. that, like you know um, where. But you know, I think it's just—it might just be too 
unusual in every way, I guess, to sort of compare that to Weinstein or whatever. But it is a kind of an, but it is sort of a moment of, um, well, yeah, the thing that everyone kind of knew was true was true, right? Where, where, um, but, but where, of course, the, the, the it doesn't appear to there doesn't appear to have been a kind of a safeguarding mechanism around these these young kids. I think Michael Jackson specifically is a unique case in that his victims were children, and I'm saying were because I there's no, all all people don't have the same accusations against a person. People who don't know each other have never met, and so if you have a documentary, a two part documentary, in fact, in which these children who are once children have similar stories, there is not a lot of children. Right. Children lie, they don't lie about stuff like that. Children lie about little stuff like, did you eat these cookies out of this jar? No, I, I see the crumbs on your hand. But they're not gonna lie about a trauma, right? And so the fact that, it's, that his, his victims were also male, that they were children, that there's a lot of blame directed at their parents, yeah. happens in the case of R. Kelly too, of why didn't these parents protect these children, makes his case, I think, different than a Harvey Weinstein case, and the fact that he's also deceased now, and so there, now there's this level of, well, you can't impugn his legacy because he's, he's, he's not around to defend himself anymore. I think all of that makes him uh, in a different realm than a, a Harvey Weinstein. I, I do wonder a bit about, in the case of Michael Jackson specifically, but I'm also thinking about Bill Cosby, um, there's a degree to which the, like people are mourning for the art or for their relationship to that art, which has not been really publicly discussed so much. There's like, can I, can't I play thriller anymore? Right. What people will ask sort of accusingly, and, it's, and what they're really saying is, but I love this music, and they're sort of misdirecting blame at like victims or advocates for victims as opposed to like the guy who took Thriller away from you was Michael Jackson. Right. <laughs> um, and this like kind of relationship of the sort of m like morally conscientious public with this beloved music or TV show uh, and how that relationship has been damaged by the um, by the actions of the perpetrator is something that I think causes a lot of sort of like unexamined grief. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that I, I probably a question for an entirely different panel discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I do sort of think about all, that a lot. It's like, what are we supposed to do with all this, all this love for all this music? Right. Uh, what I what I tend to tell people, I'm I um, I always say that I I chose to go to a historical black college because of a different world, because of of um, Bill Cosby's spinoff from the Cosby Show, and that I grew up. I actually we do these check-in questions at work. This is a side note, but it's relevant, I swear. And we do these check-in questions at work every week. And my check-in question this week was, if you could be a part of any fictional family, what part? What family would you be a part of? If you would ask me 25 years ago. The Cosby's. I would be a part of the Cosby's all day. But then you have to grapple with and realize that A, Michael Jackson, A, Bill Cosby used the power that they accrued from what they've created to harm people. Yeah. And once you realize that, it's really not that difficult not to listen to R. Kelly. Right. It's not that difficult to never watch another episode of The Cosby Show. I have the memories, you have the nostalgia, but actively engaging and watching or listening to music or, or watching a TV show or listening to music in which you know that the person who created that used the power that they accrued from that and the fame they accrued from that to harm people and to protect themselves makes it much easier, I think. And and it's a material contribution too. It's like when you stream R. Kelly, like you, you're that's, putting, that's putting money in his pocket. pocket yeah. yeah. And I mean, and the the reverse is the question that's much more rarely asked, right? Um, you know, uh, I guess I, I don't happen to think that Harvey Weinstein contributed a ton of really great movies, but think of all the careers that got cut short, right? All, all the movies that we were deprived of just by those actions, right? By people who dropped out of the industry, who who knows what they would have made, and who knows how big a fan we might be of of, of their work right now, uh, and and I think that that's uh, I think it, I think it's true that that. Uh, um, and I think I think it does belong, sort of, at the end of a conversation about the Whisper Network, that it is there is a mourning work being done there. You're you're finding about someone that you 
might care about, right? That that you ought not to, and that you um, that that you know the, the moral stock you put in them is deeply disappointed, and um, and I think that that's that's um, uh, and that's I think where the question of moral shame that that one of the questioners brought up is so is so interesting because. Um, it is sort of a testament to the fact that we still hold each other to high standards and that we fucking well should and that, you know, and that, uh, um, uh, that, that it's not, um, you know, that, that, that very few of these stories really sort of are an occasion for just all pervading cynicism saying they're all terrible. It's like, no, it turns out they're, they're not, right? Uh, but, it, but it does mean that the, that the Whisper Network has kind of this function of, of 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 creating kind of a record of like the, no this is what this, who this person really is and that's why we shouldn't be streaming their music or going to see their movies. Well, thank you too so much for for uh, being with us here today and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, yeah for the wonderful questions and for the wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thanks for